You'd be surprised at how little entrepreneurs know about the financial structures or the management structures of a venture capital firm and how critical that that can be. The way that they're structured legally for the first three to five years or so, they're funding. But generally, at the end of 10 years, they need everyone to either IPO, have an acquisition, or they need to liquidate the shares. So the financial structure, the management structure of an adventure fund is that you have general partners. They are actually fiduciarily obligated to return money. This means that by law, they need to try and maximize the returns for their investors. This is something critical to think about. If they're a horrible investment, by law, that venture fund can't really invest in them. Right? They're not there to be charity. They're there to actually get returns. If you're building something that the market genuinely needs, truly wants, and is desperate to have, a lot of the other problems fall by the wayside. This is a problem that means something to me. This is a problem that I'm gonna solve come hell or high water, whether it's through the solution that I start with or another solution, there's 10 paths to it. But without that passion, or at least without that end goal, where are you going? What are you aiming at? Where's your goal? What's your North Star? And I see very few startups that are able to articulate that meaningfully enough so that in a year or two years or five years, when things are hard, and they will be hard, that they can push through. Technology that's really hard to use or that somebody doesn't understand what it's for is worthless. The thing about exponential technologies is that if nobody can use them, they don't go very far. And so we really need to think about the experience of these exponential technologies in products. So as you work on these new problems and really try to create new technologies, you have to think about how, what is the problem that you're solving? Why are you solving that problem? And how do you make it super simple and easy for somebody to use? So there's five steps to designing exponential technology products. First is to create the framework that you're solving for. The second part is to establish design principles or product criteria. Then you do ideation, right? Um, the traditional brainstorm session of all, all ideas are good ideas with some refinement after that. The next stage is to prototype <laughs> and prototype. And prototype, then you want to push it out into the world and really get feedback. The best solutions are usually solutions around things that people don't even realize are a problem until you present a solution. And I've seen a lot of really, really amazing technologies get shelved for lack of a good use case. There's many different ways that you can accomplish that same objective by reframing which tools you're using to try to get to your solution. And that's when really great innovation is possible. At least when you come out of like GSP, you spent 10 weeks thinking about the world's biggest problems. And Made in Space was a, an answer to that. It wasn't an answer to a small little product that would make a crap ton of money in a couple years. So it's not even something you can pitch to an investor. Like the, the company was based on this vision that, that um, everything in space will be made in space. <laughs> like it's insane. Like the whole idea of the company was that it would be something that would never even be complete in our lifetimes probably. And that all we could do is just get the ball rolling on something that isn't happening and we believe should happen. As long as you can tie the big idea to something that is in the next couple years is a business, I think investors can be confident in that. And if you can show them the path from that first business and how it scales and slowly grows into something that changes the world, why well, would, I mean, that only seems like it would make it easier for an investor. You need to focus on what is the first step I can work on um, because that's where you start to make money, which allows you to grow. It's been a fight. Not everybody agrees with you. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, right? Um, and I, I guess you've all trodden that road to get here. You've s seen people agree with you and not agree with you. Um, and that doesn't change. Really, my my strategy, my experience has been to stick with the people that you can find a common understanding with. So at, at the end, I've reverted back to something that is not empirical at all, which is just relationships that you trust. I've put three years 
of my life into this. You know, I built VC funds, I built projects for 30 million people in Nigeria. I, we worked in India, so all these things, and I gave that all up to build this thing. And if it doesn't work out, and how do I go and explain it to my employees, to their kids, you know? And what about that dream that I built it for? Like, will that ever happen if I don't do it? The success of the companies and the projects and the initiatives that go out feed SU and provide credibility to the institution that draws in the world's greatest minds to come in and solve the next problems and then go out. And um, so everybody's here for a purpose. Our purpose is to go out and prove that what we're doing here makes sense. And, um, and you do it because it, it helps the world and it makes SU continue to grow so that more people can help the world. It's a great challenge. I think this is our challenge because we know about the power of SU and I think we owe that to SU. To elevate the conversation of SU is a great place to dream to. SU is the place where the world's biggest challenges are addressed and solved.